From here to the stars, I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. Our guest today is Dr. Angel Tanner, an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Mississippi State University. Her research focuses on multiple methods of detecting extrasolar planets. Other people I, I have interviewed for this uh, video series have talked about propulsion or life support, but your field is exoplanets, literally the places around other stars that we could go. So uh, let's see, you have been involved with both the Kepler and Recon's research teams. So if you would uh, describe a little bit about your work with those things. Oh, with Kepler and Recon's? That was a while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, whenever I was uh, a postdoc and a little bit into my my uh, faculty position here at Mississippi State, I was a Kepler participating scientist. And uh, we were trying to unsuccessfully uh, use Kepler data to try to find uh, planets using astrometry. So Ke the Kepler program, it finds planets using the transit method where the planet goes in front of the star. And uh, you look at the dip of the light curve as the planet goes in front of the star. Um, but the, the transit method is, uh, sorry, the, the astrometric method is actually the method of finding planets that we thought we'd be using um, in the first place. In fact, in, uh, of course, Carl Sagan's Cosmos series was a big influence for me to get into astronomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember watching on in the actual video um, him talking about looking for planets around other stars. And he used astrometry as an example. So with astrometry, you're looking for the planet by watching the star move around on the plane of the sky. You don't see the planet, but you see the gravitational tug of the planet as it wobbles the star around. Um, and that's what astrometry is, is you get a whole bunch of precise positional data, and you look to see if you can see uh, the planet astrometrically. And the Kepler data, unfortunately, had some systematic issues with it, the pixels for the Kepler data are huge. They were four arc seconds in size, which is uh, almost as big as my entire PhD thesis field of view, uh, <laughs> which was the Galactic Center. So, uh, yeah, so we, we tried for a while to get uh, the Kepler data to get some astrometry, but uh, the systematics were too great, so we couldn't quite figure it out. Mm. Uh, and recons, I think, I think if we do discover a planet astrometrically the recons group definitely probably might have um the data they're doing astrometry with ground-based telescopes and they're like the astrometry experts um so there's been no planet yet announced that discovered with astrometry but there have been multiple planets which have been confirmed with astrometry so there was just a a research note that came out where um the group's the group at Texas, they're the astrometry experts in Texas, Fritz Benedict and Barbara MacArthur. Um, they use the fine guidance sensor on Hubble, which is celebrating its 30th birthday today. Mm -hmm. um, they use the fine guidance sensor, and they know how to get the data from the fine guidance sensor, and then they can, um, they've gone back and uh, now for the systems that they know that there's a planet around, they've got the astrometric measurements of the star and they, it's nice because that lets them estimate the orbit of the planet a little bit more precisely when they get the astrometry. So they just published a paper where they did it for Proxima Centauri, which has got two planets around it right now that we know of, and they've measured the orbits of one of the planets around Proxima Centauri, which of course is the closest plant, the closest star system to us besides, you know, the sun. So. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that the the recons uh, concentrated on planets that were that were orbiting stars that are near to the Earth, uh, spheroids centered on the Earth. Um, and what was the results from that? What was, uh, what was the outcome from that? Well, recons, we didn't really, uh, we haven't really, I don't think they've published any planet. That was, that was when I was a postdoc a few years ago. Okay, okay. Um, but the, the Gaia missions get to probably, um, mm. the, Ga the Gaia mission's going to produce a bunch of planets. Mm -hmm. Um, Whenever they they have all the data, they just have they've got a few billion stars mm -hmm. to go through. Um, but once they do, they they've been releasing all their there's catalogs and stages. So mm -hmm. right now they're on what they call DR two, um, and they will be uh, releasing DR three I think in the next year 
if there's no delays with the virus, and uh, some of that might contain some planets. So, and that's an astrometric mission, the Gaia mission. I know that one of your focuses is on habitable planets, the not just the search for planets in general, but habitable planets. Um, and um, I have a hypothetical question for you. Um, and that is, if we could snap our fingers and suddenly have a spacecraft in orbit around an Earth-like extrasolar planet right now, how long, how long would it take before we could figure out that it was safe to land on it and begin building homes and businesses, build a civilization, and what tests would we have to run? Oh, that's a good question. So, with, with your hypothetical, are we assuming today's technology? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So today's technology, whenever I think of that, and I do think of that every once in a while, I usually think, you know, it's more the Star Trek timeline where you've got all the sensors and everything. Yeah, but there's too much fudge factor in that. <laughs> well, we do, we do a pretty, I mean, you can tell the key, you can tell a lot just from looking at it. You can <laughs> t you can see clouds mm -hmm. and we can do pretty good, our, um, our imaging on the ground is pretty good, uh, you know, spy satellite wise. If I think of spy satellites, mm -hmm. they can see down in orbit. They can see down to a, a few. It's never what you think it is because they always keep that part secret. Probably a few inches, at least a foot resolution now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty good to image the geology. So there's that. And um, I think, given that we could do. The composition of the atmosphere around extrasolar planets right now, um, I bet we could probably do pretty good spectroscopy of the con of the of what's in the atmosphere of a planet we were orbiting around it, even with today's technology. Um, with the virus that we're dealing with now, I'm wondering, can we test to say see if this biology is safe or compatible with our own? That's true. So I was thinking about the composition of the atmosphere. Now I'm thinking. Now you're getting the biology, which I'm I'm horrible at. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to look for critters, what I call critters of all sizes. Yeah. Then I would probably I'd probably send down some robots first. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that that would be harder to tell. Given you can't even tell even if the virus is in my house right now, which I'm sure freaks a lot of people out. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, the microbes, the critters, the nastiness. I would definitely probably make some sort of a biology critter detecting virus, mm -hmm. bacteria detecting uh, robot. I mean, anything that's macroscopic, mm -hmm. you can send a robot down to take pictures. Mm. But that kind of thing. So the answer apparently is months and possibly even years, even if we were in orbit around it. Well, I don't know about months or years. I would hope that even if we could snap our fingers, still show up with the right equipment. So uh, I think with the, the people that made the equipment, I mean, we did that with Viking. We did a, some some very basic chemical tests, mm -hmm. although being not right. But even in the 70s, they were thinking about this. What kind of chemistry can you do with Martian soil to mm -hmm. figure out if there's life? Mm -hmm. um, so all you have to do is grow some things in Petri dishes, too. I could imagine that completely being done automated. Mm -hmm. And then they send up the data, um, even just based on what we do with Mars now. That was Dr. Angel Tanner. This has been From Here to the Stars, a video series created by the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop. The TVIW is a nonprofit organization dedicated to thoroughly exploring the science and engineering that can eventually open up the reality of interstellar travel. I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, and you can subscribe to our channel for other such videos. On behalf of all of us here at the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, I thank you.